Uh, I hope everyone here is well. Um, if you're new to these events, uh, this is uh, the, the London 14 Society. We gather in London, but also online to talk about strange and wonderful things. Um, we regard ourselves as kind of skeptical, not believing. We're kind of in between. You're more than welcome to put your, uh, your, your make your own mind up about these things. Uh, we just control things by putting on great speakers. And it's about time for another mermaid talk. So I'm going to introduce uh, Vaughan Scrivener in a moment. Uh, firstly, this is how we do things in the online world. Um, so uh, Vaughan will begin speaking in a moment. He'll speak for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll go straight to a live q and I'm turning my sound up. I don't want to get in closer, so hopefully you can all hear me now. Um, if you do have a question to ask, um, at the bottom of Zoom, there's a Q&A bubble. Type your question in there. Let us know if you'd like to make your uh, microphone live so you can ask a question directly to Vaughan. Otherwise, if you, if you haven't got a microphone or if you're feeling a bit shy, let us know and I will read your question out in my best received pronunciation uh, that I can manage at this time of night. Um, what else? Let's have a look. Let's have a do that. Um, when we open your microphone, we won't open your camera, so people will be able to hear you, they won't be able to see you, so don't worry about that. I'm thinking of doing that myself a lot in these. So London Fortune Society, we do great talks, we're sort of voluntary and we run on whatever donations you make. Conway Hall exists to bring fascinating talks to people. If you've not donated to this talk, please do. It's a, it's a, it's a fine anti-institution of London and now the world and the internet. Um, and I think that's where we'll go. Um, Vaughan, every few years we uh, we do a talk on mermaids. Mermaids are a perennial, perennially fascinating thing. We haven't quite had as many talks on mermaids as we had about, say, spring heel jack, ghosts, or a talking mongoose, but we're getting there. Vaughan is helping us. He's written uh, an amazing book on mermaids. That's the book. Uh, my people, sorry. Uh, my people. There are tritons do happen in here too. And I'm sorry, I, I'm certainly not triton excluding here. And as, organi as an organisation, none of us are. So um, I'm going to shout up now. Uh, do please welcome Vaughan Scribner. Scribner, sorry. Vaughan is a um, assistant professor of history at the University of Central Arkansas. Uh, he's also written a book about organisations that met in pubs in early America, which I will also be fascinating, fascinated to read, seeing as I help run an organisation that runs events in pubs in very, very late United Kingdom, because we haven't got long left. But do please welcome, don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A, uh, Vaughan Professor Vaughan Scribner. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this. This is something that has really been on my mind, if you will, for I think three years now, four years? So um, probably more like four. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen to get started with this, make sure I do this right. So, as you'll see here, oops, I did the wrong thing. Just a minute. Sorry. Zoom land. Okay, yeah. And I, actually, I was just promoted to associate professor, which is was great. Nice little uh, change for me. Sorry. No, no. It, it's it says that on my book. It's you are totally off the hook on that one, Scott. This happened. This happened during all of the COVID craziness. It was a small good thing to happen during all the bad. Um, so I want to start off by just talking about how impressed I am with this, the book that Reaction put together. I have a couple images of it here. The book itself, not to be too like selly here, but it's, a, it's one of the nicer books I've ever really dealt with and read. That's, it's got heavy gloss paper, something around 70 color images. I'm trying to find a good example here, you know, something like this. It's really incredible. So I, I really want to thank Reaction Books first and foremost for reaching out to me uh, about writing this book, uh, being so supportive along the way, helping me in every step, and then just really putting together a, a book that I couldn't be more proud of just as a, as a form. I think that something we, we're losing sometimes today is really high quality books. Um, I think publishers are apt sometimes to just put, put the cheapest product out there and Reaction didn't do that. They put a really high quality book out at a really good cost. So I really appreciate that. Now, Scott mentioned that my other books on colonial American taverns, 
And that's really what I'm primarily usually do. And, you know, this Merv people thing is kind of the second life I've taken on. Um, I wrote a book that came out in 2019 called Incivility, Early American Taverns and Civil Society. And I've done a lot of work on public spaces in colonial America and the British Empire, everything from pleasure gardens to spas, um, to green space, to urban space, to slavery in the West Indies. But what for what I do, I have to read a lot of newspapers and travel narratives. So four years ago, I think it was four, the time flies, especially during all this, I was reading a travel narrative by a guy named John Jocelyn. He's an English naturalist. He was an English naturalist in the 17th century. And he was in Virginia. And out of nowhere, he talked about how his friends went ashore and he decided he was just going to stay on their canoe and read a book. And he claimed that a merman clambered over the side of his canoe and he cut its arm off and it fell back into the water and it, it left this pool of purple blood. And I'd never read anything like this in my research. I, you know, you come across weird stuff sometimes, but not this. I thought, what is this? So I, I put it aside. I was like, I'm going to come back to this. I'm, I'm working on something else. Well, the very next day, I'm reading Ben Franklin's Pennsylvania Gazette, and he reports the sighting of a merman in Spain. And at this point, I thought, okay, there's something here. I have to get into this. So I started researching this, and I came across an incredible spate of mer people sightings, specimens, narratives, studies in the 17th and 18th century. And this led me to start looking into a lot. Now, I was working on an article about how in the 18th century, the smartest men in the world um, believed in mermaids and mermen chased them all around. But as I was doing that, I came across something that I think is really interesting. And I think deserves a quick mention here. You see that I have an image of John Smith up on my PowerPoint slide here. Well, I kept coming across other historians saying that John Smith had seen a mermaid or claimed that he had seen a mermaid in the um, early 17th century. It ranged from 1611 to 1613 and 1614. And they quoted him with this idea that she had long green hair and he actually kind of fell in lust with her. And this went up to a recent, as recent as 2015, someone had cited this sighting. And, but every time I looked in this footnotes to where this came from, it was citing another secondary source, another history book. And so this led me on this, um, this, this, almost like a scavenger hunt, if you will. Where did this come from? When did he say he saw this? And it ended up, I would trace back. So I said, well, I'll just get his writings. I'll just, all of his writings are published in one big volume. I went through every, everywhere, every time he was in America or near America, never did he ever mention anything about mermaids. Um, I eventually write, a, started, I, these were my first publications on people. I wrote a couple of posts for a, an early Americanist blog called the Junto where at first I thought it was Alexander Dumas who started this, but it wasn't. I ended up tracing it back to a writer in the 1640s, 1647, who misattributed a mermaid sighting from Richard Whitbourne, another English captain to John Smith, which I think is because John Smith was a really popular person at the time, even though he died a few years earlier, had more celebrity star power there. But that started my real interest with this. Just beyond mer people, it was fun because I was able to track down um, a, a, an alleged mermaid sighting that has been, you go on the internet right now, you can just search John Smith mermaid, and you'll see people still claiming he saw a mermaid, but he never did. So that was kind of, that, beyond just the interest in mermaids, that was a cool thing that I was able to kind of track down the, the origins or the nexus of this historical mistake. Now, beyond that, I started looking into why were people, what were they thinking? I have here a part of a letter, it's really hard to read. Uh, this is from Cotton Mather in the early 1716, he wrote a letter to the Royal Society of London. He was living in New England at the time, where he argued that three men um, near his home had seen a mermaid. And he says, uh, at last my credulity is entirely conquered and I can, and I am compelled now to believe in the existence of a, of a triton uh, for such a one that's just been exhibited in my own country. Um, so he's, he writes this long letter. It's really hard. To, this, this whole letter took me hours to actually transcribe, which is both fun and frustrating. Um, I wrote a piece for uh, a journal called Itinerario, which will, it's part of my chapter. And then eventually I used that, some of that research to write a cover piece here for History Today magazine, which I thanks History Today too. They really helped me 
um, think of some of my, you know, get to the core of some of my thoughts. So out of all of this, Reaction Books reaches out to me and asks me to write this book. Now I agreed, but then I also got scared because as I've mentioned, I'm a historian of 17th and 18th century colonial America and the British Empire broadly conceived. But this book was going to force me to expand beyond my temporal and geological, um, ge geological, geographical boundaries. Now, before I get into my kind of my overview of this book, I want to say that and I mentioned this in my book, I could not have written this book um, to this extent 20 years ago. For one, I was 14 years old then. But more than that, just the, the interconnectivity of the world now was incredible. I was able to reach out to all these different people who have done, to have done research on mermaids, uh, mermaid related um, things uh, throughout the world. They were in, in an email way, they shared images with me, they shared information with me. I was able to use all kinds of search engines, access ancient medieval texts that have been scanned. So it was really this odyssey. And I don't think I'm ever gonna have another experience working on a historical topic like this again. And I hope it comes through in the book. Uh, this is a white, you know, although the first five chapters are concentrated on mer people through a Western lens, it's still a very global study that really transcends certain ideas of time and space. Now, my main thesis of the book is the book uses mer people to gain a deeper understanding of one of the most ca mysterious, capricious, and dangerous creatures on earth, humans. Now, as you see, I mentioned this in my chat, I think that mer people they're, they act like this, the sirens, the, the mirror that she traditionally holds. They're a reflection of us. We impose our ideas about who we are, um, how we see the world, and we, what we really we want the world to be onto these creatures. And we really have. Something else I argue is that whenever and wherever humans have existed, we found merpeople. Um, we created them, we found them, whatever you want to think. And this is something that I've really that I still don't have an answer for. And I think, I think that this is something interesting in this too, is that this research leaves you with more questions than answers. Um, most of the modern books, uh, by modern I mean 19th and 20th century, historical studies of mer people, they don't end with a conclusive mer people don't exist. Now, something I always have to say whenever I tell someone that I study mermaids is I don't believe in mer people. And I don't necessarily, but I also think that mer people are so interesting is because they force us to butt up against um, discovery, exploration, and something I argue in the in the history today piece is we're still looking for mer people. They just take on different guises now. So in the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th century, mer people represented different ideas of science and exploration for different people. Well, today we're exploring you know, farther distances of the, um, of our, of, you know, of our solar system, of the galaxies. We're thinking about different dimensions. Um, and I know the 14th society is all about this, and I am too. Well, we've only just really, really explored 5% of the ocean. We've got space archaeologists now who are able to use ground penetrating technology, satellite technology to uncover lost civilizations. So we, we're still looking for mermaids in our own ways, whether literally or figuratively. So I really want to push that before I get into this talk and that when I'm tracing our long interaction with mer people, that hasn't stopped. Sometimes we just give them different names. Now, in through all of this, it's a reflection on us. So investigating mer people, whether in the you know ancient Assyria or uh, a coffee shop in modern day London, the Starbucks sign, it is a reflection and a um, investigation of us, of, of, of us as humans. And I'm going to come back to that. So this is what I'm getting at. I think this is a good example of this from cathedrals to coffee houses. Now what we have here are three different representations of mer people. Um, the one on the left is from the 15th century. It is a drawing of a twin-tailed siren uh, that would have been popular in bestiaries and books and carvings and ch from churches to like I said, books. On the far right is a 14th century carving from the Exeter of St. Paul's, um, St. Paul's Cathedral and the Exeter Cathedral in England. And then of course in the middle is the original, original Starbucks logo. Now you might notice that they're all in the same form. They're all in fact almost identical. 
the original Starbucks logo was ripped directly from this illustration of a twin-tailed siren who had appeared in a book only a few years before Starbucks originated in the late 70s, um, so early 80s. Now, I bring this up here for various reasons. One, I want us to concentrate and think about the idea that mermaids are everywhere. Mer people are everywhere. This is one of the biggest things that I've started to think about after since I've started doing this research. Everywhere you turn, you find mermaids. Um, it, you go into any, any cathedral in the UK now, and I would almost guarantee that you are going to find mer people represented. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. They're the logo of the largest chain of coffee in the world. Now, today, if you look at the Starbucks logo, they've zoomed way, way in on the mermaid. The reason for this is that this is a rather sexualized image of the mermaid in that she is spreading her, her tails apart. Now, this was for various reasons, as I'll get to um, I'll talk about this in my first chapter of my book. It's mostly because the Christian church created our modern idea of what a mermaid looks like. They did so in an effort to denigrate um, femininity, to, to have this idea of the dangers of, of the female flesh. But I just think this is a good example right off the bat of showing this, trans, this transcendence of this image of the mermaid that we still hold today. Now, our modern mermaid um, ideas of the, the mermaid have much deeper roots though than just the medieval Christian church. This is one of these things where I, I, come, I came across a lot of this and it really fascinated me. Now on the right here is a very popular image of the siren. We have Odysseus at the ship's mast. I forgot one of my quotation marks there. Uh, 480 to 70 BCE in Greece. Now this is the thing. Our ideas of mermaids, that they're not just a Western phenomenon. Because here you have over here owns blessing the fleet. 8th century BCE from modern day Iraq. This is an engraving. You see the owns uh, the ancient Assyrian uh, god depicted as a merman right there with fish in, in clear detail. Now, this was in the Middle East. Western notions, more Western, you know, Mediterranean notions of the mermaid as this dangerous siren originally come from ideas of the siren. But the siren, of course, originally didn't have fish tail. Now, where did that come from? Scholars kind of, we, we still are trying to figure this out. We don't exactly know. I would argue, though, it comes from these early Christian church, the, the early Christian church's attempts to create these half-human uh, hybrids that not only have these connections to the sea, you see here that you can still see in this Roman funerary plaque from Rome, uh, second, or, yeah, it's 200 to 400 CE, oftentimes, of course, the early Christian kind of cryptic, cryptic symbol uh, was a fish. You see here Jonah cast up in a carving from 280 to 90 CE. Jonah being half swallowed by this fish and in this way um, distribute, exhibiting kind of this hybrid form. But it's all still pretty blurry um, in, in these ancient times. You have some gods and goddesses depicted as half man or half woman and half fish. Um, you have things like deserto, um, but it's all still pretty muddy. It's all still a pretty muddy process. I would argue that this all really kind of congeals and, and it becomes more clear in the medieval period. Now here I have this idea of medieval monsters. Now I wanna make sure, oh, no, no, I didn't wanna do. Oops, I almost, okay, you guys can still, yeah, okay, good. Um, medieval monsters, I wanted to bring up, I have my captions here. So here you have, Three separate images. On the top is a, car a carving of a mermaid in St. Mary's Church, Atterbury, England, circa 1300 to 1500 CE. On the bottom left there, you have the bestiary from the 13th century. And on the top right, you have um, the Luttrell Psalter from 1325 to 40. I'm going to share my screen again, big again. I didn't mean to do that. So what all of these show us are these different, different representations of mer people, but they all would have been in the church setting. Now, why is this important? Well, first off, you have the top here. Once again, we have a spread-tailed mermaid carved into a church. When I was in the UK two summers ago for uh, leading a study abroad trip, I challenged my students wherever we went to look for mermaids, and they found them everywhere. The churches were especially fun because you never knew where you're going to find them. Uh, you can find an example, for instance, in... Uh, 
um, St. Paul's Cathedral, not that, sorry, not St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, Westminster Cathedral carved into one of the benches in wood. You also see them carved into the ceiling and rot and, and you know roof corbels. You see them carved into the walls. Uh, when I was in, when I was at the York Minster uh, in, in York, of course, I'm, crawl I'm climbing up to go to the top and I'm on the outside of the cathedral te technically. They're carved in the spires up there. Now, you wouldn't have been able to see those very well originally until they you know, created this easier walkway outside, but you still could see them. Now, they are very sexualized forms in this period, and that would have been rare. Women, topless women like this, weren't a common facet in the medieval church. Now, you're gonna find fantastical, fantastical creatures oftentimes in the medieval church, but not in such, I would argue, kind of sexualized forms. Why is that? Well, church leaders, like I said earlier, are trying to denigrate the feminine, uh, create this very male-centered idea of Christianity in the medieval period. Now, this, of course, you know, this is part of this long process of kind of going away from these more what they considered pagan ideas of religion, but also embracing some as well. So they're kind of forming these ancient pagan ideas and these kind of more modern at the time Christian ideas. So they can still keep people but also use, use some ideas to draw them in, but also kind of repulse them at the same time. So you still let you see these, uh, this image from the Luttrell Psalter on the bottom right. There she has, pro she, this is a classic, she has prominent breasts, a pretty face, long hair, fish tail, and then she's holding a comb in one hand and a mirror in the other. Uh, scholars still argue about what they all mean. The mirror perhaps reflecting her vanity as well as the comb, but the mirror also encouraging the reader or the onlooker to reflect upon his usually own relationship with God. It's also no um, coincidence that the mirror and the comb are in, in gold, which would have leapt off the page at the reader. Here you have also the classic idea of the siren as a dangerous creature of the sea that lures men to their deaths. Here you have, once again, uh, women with exposed breasts, long hair. These men are asleep and they're, they're gonna bring them down in the ocean. So people in the early medieval period would have grown up around a culture of mer people. They would have seen mer, mer men were more late ancient as the medieval period comes in. Tritons kind of get pushed away for a while. Although as, if you read my book, you'll see that there were mer monks and mer bishops represented, but they were men fully covered, kind of more stayed. But the women, mer, mer, you know, uh, mermaids were always depicted way more sexualized in this form of danger. So people, whether elites or lower class people, would have grown up in the medieval period and well into the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries surrounded by mer people, not just in the church, but eventually through broadsides, images, um, as print becomes more widely circulated and Bibles and religious texts are more widely circulated, they're going to be, they're going to see them there a lot. Really, I, I would encourage you to go, you'll, you'll see in my book more, but if you go to the, from the 15th through the 17th century, any bestiary you look at, any, almost any religious text in the mar marginalia, you're going to find mermaids. Same with, uh, like I said, churches. And I would encourage you all to just keep looking for them a little bit more. Any church you visit in the UK, ask to see their mermaid. Usually the people there would be like, oh yeah, we have a couple here. And even if they say, I don't know if we have any, you can probably find them. They're there, look up, look around, look closely. Sometimes they're hiding a little bit more, but it's a fun game to play. Now, I mentioned that people grew up around a culture of mer people. This is something I've thought about a lot because what you have happened in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries is an eruption of sightings around the world. Now, sightings go way back to Pliny the Elder, uh, you know, various other very notable people. But as Cotton Mather says in his letter that I showed you earlier, generally he said that by the early modern period, the 17th century, Pliniisms were out of fashion, that they didn't really trust Pliny anymore, that he was probably, you know, just like we do today, like, oh, that was a long time ago. We're past that. We're modern now. So here's the thing, though. As Europeans venture out into the rest of the world, they almost expect to see mer people because they've been in this culture of them. Stories about mer people, images of mer people, alleged sightings, even some specimens, mermaids' hands and things they'll talk about. And so it might not be a surprise that as they go into these strange worlds, they're expecting to find new wonders. Uh, you know, you have people writing about men with no heads, but their heads on their chest, all sorts of things like dragons, um, centaurs, mermaids as well. Now this, what you're looking at here is, I compiled this 
This is all the verified mer people sightings from primary sources I could find from my readings, my various readings. So here, the black represents pre or six pre 17th century sightings. So you see here that as uh, Europeans start to go out into, they stick here with you know Eastern UK, Western Europe. They're they're starting to go try to go down around the uh, down around Africa. You see some here in the kind of the Mediterranean region. And then you see some down here in the Caribbean, which makes sense as that's where they started their first you know, major efforts. The blue is 17th century. It traces where they're going more. Here you have North America, farther up north into um, Greenland and Iceland. You have some more in Europe. They're going further east into kind of starting getting the Ottoman Empire a little bit here almost. Uh, I guess you have a really far one here in, the, in black too. And then finally, from red, you see that they're expanding around the world. You have the East Indies, a lot of sightings popping up there that we'll see in Africa, throughout Europe, and way more in North America and um, neighboring islands. I think this is important and interesting because it allows us to kind of, uh, and all, this is important too, a huge increase in sightings around the UK and Western Europe. Now, this only makes sense because as, there's, as people are, quote, seeing more mer people abroad, they're going to expect to, quote, see more mer people in their locality. And you can really trace that. Now, like I was saying, I think this is important. Let me make sure it's good on my tongue. I can't see. I, this, I think this is really important because it allows us to kind of trace the narrative of how this is going. Now, this isn't even the peak yet. We're going to see that in the 19th century, mer people sightings and stories like this blow this away. Here's the thing, though. They're not, just, these sightings are being accompanied by more than just, um, just stories in newspapers. Here you have uh, an alleged sighting from the 17th century um, from Canada. A uh, reverend said he saw a mermaid, a merman, he drew him here. Now this merman is almost a combination of a classic image of a mer bishop and then kind of a creature of some sort. Now it's important though, you'll see that he depicts this merman it, next to a frog and flies. So he's, he's placing a merman along very real creatures. And he's not going to be the only one to do this. We also have Richard Whitborn's famous sighting. Uh, this image is from um, uh, Ludwig Gottfried's um, America. You see here a classical, a more classical image of these sirens coming and, and greeting Richard Whitborn and his men, trying to get them to come into the ocean. The natives are scared of them. And you have these different, these are only two of many I have in the book. I couldn't include all of them. But what I'm trying to get at here is as they're adventuring in these new worlds, they expect to find mer people there. And if, you know, perception is everything. If you expect to find something, I would argue that you're going to. The question, though, comes up. Voices of reason. It's not like they're just a bunch of quacks saying they're seeing these mer people. You have very respected thinkers saying this. So just, these are just three among dozens. Um, as I note in my book, though Columbus found mermaids not so beautiful as they're painted in 1493, he can see that, quote, to some extent they have the form of a human face. In 1523, the Swiss philosopher Conrad Gessner contended that a man fish about the size of a boy was seen at Rome. And in 1533, the Spaniard Diego Hurtado claimed to encounter a merman off the coast of Polynesia. Seen by all the crew near a deserted island, or desert island, he said, 30 leagues from the continent, the merman leapt about in the water like a monkey with his eyes fixed on the crew like a creature endued with reason. Throughout these sightings, you see a few things coming up. One, the way they're describing these mermaids and mermen isn't like a, 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 you know, a seal um, or a, uh, no man, I just blanked on the, a manatee. Two, increasingly, especially after the 16th and 17th centuries, they always say that other people saw it. They're these verified sources. So they know that people are gonna be suspicious. So they get other people, well-respected, trusted people to come say, yes, I saw these as well. And then Henry Hudson says the same thing. Um, I mean, here, so here we have Christopher Columbus and Henry Hudson saying that they see mer people. Um, now, wh where, where does this take us? I don't really have a good answer for this. What were they seeing? I don't know. I know that if you stare at the waves long enough, you can see all sorts of things. At the same time, as they're branching out, you also see mermaids and mermen appearing in almost uh, um, most any map you're gonna see of the world, especially the fancier ones. 
you're going to see mermaids and mermen depicted. Uh, here you see a mermaid off the south coast, uh, off the coast of South America. You oftentimes see them near South Amer uh, Africa, East Indies. Usually mermaids and mermen are depicted in the far branches of the ocean, far reaches of the ocean, where they didn't know as much out there, and they kind of expected to find these strange creatures like mermaids and mermen. Now, comes back to the question, were they just doing this to provide illustrations or was there a deeper, was there a deeper meaning in this? I would argue that it's somewhere kind of in between. I have a question and answer here. Um, seems to believe in mermaids based on something more than just fan. Yes, that's, um, Frank asked this question about if they were, were they based on real creatures? That's a great question. And I think maybe they were. In fact, there's a example, Frank, in the 18th century, apparently in France, uh, a mermaid washed up on shore and these two little girls, they claim to cut its arms off and attack it and stab it with knives. Now, I don't know if this was actually a mermaid or if this was some creature, but there are oftentimes they're, they're interacting with them. Uh, Ruth said there's been quite a lot of lit relating to the use here. I'll come, I should probably do this at the end. Um, so this gets us into the clear into the 18th century. Here we have enlightened experiments. So this is what's happening. I guess this branches off perfectly with this idea of specimens washing up. Because you see here the popularity of mermaid specimens, especially, specimens, especially hands, ribs, and other portions of skeletons, grew during the 18th century. One collector in Middlesex, England, held the rib of a triton or merman in his private collection in 1713, while in 1722 the English geographer Patrick Gordon claimed to have viewed mermaid hands in the repository of natural rarities at Le Le Leiden in the Museum Regium at Copenhagen. The Royal Society of London held mermaid hands. Um, and you're finding all these specimens, a big, you know, as you all know, uh, you know, you have these cabinets of curiosity starting to spring up this time. And almost any cabinet of curiosity worth its salt had a mermaid or, or merwoman specimen in it. I can't stress that enough. All right, I keep going here so I get through these. And finally, just beyond bones, you see mermaid specimens being drawn in clear detail as well. Here is a siren in Louis, Louis Renard's Poisoned Crevice, a, a crabs. I don't speak, I'm not good at French. I was recently presented in France and I was self-conscious the whole time. Uh, this is from 1754. This was, he says that he found this in the East Indies while he was there and he captured her and he kept her in a tub of water for multiple days, but she wouldn't eat, so she died. But he also, he, two important things here. He drew her to look like one of the island's natives and I, I wish I should include this full picture, but she is included in a book that the whole rest of the book are real creatures, real verified creatures. Now, why did he do this? Did he really think she existed or did he think that this would give a flourish? I don't know, it caused a stir at the time. On the far right here is uh, Diagote, a mermaid with measuring scale. This was apparently exhibited in France as well. This was exhibited in France, um, caught on Saint Martinique. You see here that he includes, this is a very ugly mermaid by modern standards. Um, and actually, it makes its way to the Gentleman's Magazine, and they use, they start to ascribe racial theory to it at the time, saying, well, this was a black mermaid, and then they had a white mermaid uh, that had more delicate features, really getting these theories of race and racial difference, especially, um, you know, among men and women, black men and women. And so by the Enlightenment period, when you have these experiments going on, they start to really try to apply what they consider their modern day ideas of trial and error, type, you know, um, theory. Uh, his, you know, method to these mer creatures. These are just only two of various specimens that were drawn and analyzed during this time. Now you have this transition period coming in going in late 18th, early 19th century, when you have an interesting combination of freak shows and fantasies where Westerners are starting to reflect more on how they feel about mermaids and where mermaids fit in the world. I should also mention that Carl Linnaeus, the father of modern day classification, spent much of his life chasing mermaids around the world. He, spends, he sends uh, letters to the Royal Society of uh, Sweden saying that we need to go find these mer people. There have been reports of them. It's huge, we've got to do this. You know, he's trying to order the natural world all the time. And mermaids would be very interesting because they would provide this kind of, well, where they fit. Um, other people argue that they're very important. Uh, a guy, De Malier, writes the, tel the, the Teliamed, where he argues that mer people are real and that they exhibit humankind's aquatic origins. And this is in the 18th century. So they're on to something there that, you know, we now know scientific 
studies argue that humans came from the ocean. So they're onto something there already. Two more interesting prints here that I think show this well. John Poss, who was a pretty famed engraver who other than this one did like mechanical and industrial engravings to, to great success. In 1817, he publishes mermaids exhibited successively in the, successively in the years 1758, 75 and 1795. Now this, so here you have, this is the 1795 one at the bottom, but up here on the left, you have what we just looked at. The, uh, then this is the a supposed white mermaid that I was talking about earlier. And in the London Gentleman's Magazine, they compared these two, like I was saying, um, in various ways. Here on the right, by 1878, you have London's Illustrated Police News runs this interesting. So there was a, mer so the Westminster Aquarium advertised that it had a mermaid. Well, by this time, mermaid was synonymous, and we'll get to and we'll get into why that was more synonymous more with just the manatee. So on the far right here, you have the mermaid as manatee. On the far left, you have the ideal mermaid. Down there, you have the dugong carrying young, and then in the middle, you have the Japanese idea of a mermaid. So four, really three representations of mermaids here: the classic dugong or manatee, also called a mermaid. These ideal mermaids of lore and then these Japanese ideas of a mermaid. Now the Japanese idea of a mermaid are very, very important in the 19th century because two men, Captain Edith, who's a, a, Brit, a British person and P.T. Barnum, an American, are going to hoist, or foist I should say, these Japanese mermaids on Western audiences. This is going to um, basically um, create a, the ultimate spike in belief in mer people and then the ultimate decline in belief in mer people in the Western world. So I identified three phases of mer people interest. Uh, mainly through looking, I scoured thousands of newspapers. I was able to, once again, I word search the term mermaid in newspapers.com, which is a repository of basically most newspapers uh, published in the Western world in the 19th century. And I also went through the New York Times, uh, London Times, but I found thousands of hits, oftentimes because ships were named mermaid. There were other things like that, taverns. But three phases of merpeople interest. The first phase, 1800 to 1822, was wedded to enlightenment ideas with a constant spate of newspaper articles on merpeople. Second phase, 1822 to 45, the boom and bust years, I would argue, with an average of four merpeople articles per year and a craze for Fiji mermaid specimens, which ultimately damned the belief in them. So if you were living between 1822 and 1845, you would have had an average of four different articles every year on the reality of mermaids. So you can see how people would have been kind of primed to believe in these mermaids. And by the time Captain Edis brings his mermaid over in 1822, which is depicted here, people are ready to believe in it. And I can't stress this enough. He has this drawing done of it. He ends up having, and you know, here's an advertisement for it, the mermaid now exhibiting at the Turf Coffee House in London. Captain Edis bought the mermaid, he sold a ship that wasn't his in the East Indies. So he's over there in the 1820s, a Japanese mer uh, craftsman offers him this mermaid, which he thinks is real. He sells a ship that isn't his for it, gets this mermaid, brings it back to London, thinks it's real, invites scientists to take a look at it. However, he does so with the kind of agreement that they won't publish their findings. They quickly realize it's just a fabrication, but that doesn't matter because in the meantime, he makes a lot of money. Eventually, when more and more people, when so scientists start publishing that this is fake, he's ruined. He has to he, he has to get rid of the mermaid. That's when P.T. Barnum buys it a while later, takes it to America, and does the same thing. You see here um, that this 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 is what uh, one of these Fiji mermaids looked like. Well, there are two ways. They're either in this laying down position or they're in the screen position here. Um, now you can of course take the screen position and lay it down too if you want. They were half codfish, half monkey usually, uh, combined, combined together with metal, paper mache, fake fur, and real fur. Finally, 1845 to 1900, the post-Barnum years, which is an age of science, the rise of hoax, fun, art, myth around mermaids. So scientists, start to, scientists and historians start to write books about mermaids where they start to um, investigate them as fake creatures. And then they also start to be associated way more with hoaxes, fun. They embrace kind of the myth. They start running newspaper advertisements like this. You see here, this is an American advertisement where it's all about, they go and visit one of these mermaid makers and kind of 
draw the curtain back on how they're made. By the 19th and 20th centuries, they kind of um, transitioned to modern muses. You have these three, three seeds here, capitalism, culture, and creativity. You have classic paintings of, um, you know, of sirens here. Um, here, Odysseus tied to the mast. Mast, I mean, the mermaid on the left here. You also, though, have the birth of what I would call the modern mermaids. This here on the picture, picture on the left is a woman named Annette Kellerman, lived between 1887 to 1975. She moved from Australia to England in 1906 and then America in 1907. She was a world champion swimmer, uh, but she was also a pioneer in various ways. She popularized the one-piece swimming suit, was deemed the perfect woman by the American media, starred in a number of aquatic films where she usually played a mer mermaid, opened her own movie production business, became one of the first Main Street actresses to perform nude on film, and act in various vaudeville shows. One of her most popular characters was English Johnny, in which she performed as a man. So this kind of take this whole mermaid thing full circle, this kind of hybrid identity. Now, I call her a modern mermaid because she was one of the first mermaids to use this idea of sex and capitalism and culture and creativity to bring it all into one. She knew what she was doing. She held swimming classes, she held health classes, she was a rich, pretty independent woman, uh, especially for the early, the early 19th century. From her on, you have various, uh, this kind of modern depiction of mermaids, oftentimes used very, just very advertised in a very sexualized way, whether it's Chicken of the Sea Mermaid, 1984 film, 84 film Splash. You have these 1948 films, Mr. Peabody and the Mermaid and Miranda. Um, Again, this is more my book where Miranda is very much more this modern mermaid where she's um, very sexually independent, where the mermaid, Mr. Peabody, the mermaid is more kind of an object of sex, sexual lust from the man. Uh, this is an early 20th century advertisement for uh, Eagle Steamers on the um, you know, Thames River in London. You see, you know, this is pretty a uh, pretty lurid advertisement for that time period. Now, Finally, I get into this in my final chapter. I just want to make sure I get, give, give time for questions here. You have in the global waters. As I mentioned, where, whenever and wherever humans have lived, they have found people. Now, my chapter gets way more into this than here, but this, these are ancient South African drawings, of uh, cave drawings of merpeople. Uh, that they're, 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 they're definitely fish-tailed. Some people argue they're swallows. I am thinking more it's they're fish-tailed and they're, they were part of um, shamans, uh, water dances. These are from Henry Schoolcraft, who studied Native American peoples in the 19th century in North America. This here on the top left is Myungun, who was one of their, um, one of their gods, drawn as fish-tailed, and was one of the gods of the water. You see here a Nyongo Nozu, a flyer of a mermaid from 1803 in Japan. You have twin-tailed sirens, much like we saw earlier. So this is a Narmakara figurine carved into a Mathura archway, which is in present-day India. This is from the first century CE. And below that, you have another fish-tailed uh, creature. This is from um, the, the Benin people. Um, and his laser mud puppy fish, a symbol of the sea god Olokun. So you have this idea of the spread tail, the um, you know, kind of Melusine mer people. Now we have it Western Europe, uh, throughout Europe, Africa, um, the Middle East. Uh, in, in the Far East, generally speaking, you have um, Western ideas of mer people integrating more into uh, East Asian ideas. So for instance, you see here this Nyongo Nozu. Their Nyongo didn't have to be totally half human. This just has a human head and a fish body. But as they interacted with Westerners more from Thailand to Japan to China, to the Philippines, they start integrating um, half human, more Western ideas of half human, half fish. Now I can't, you also have this idea of Mami Wata in Africa, mermaid uh, people. You have the Caribbean ideas of Mami Wata making their way over there. You have Ru Russian Rusalpi, um, I could keep going. But basically throughout the world, there are mer people uh, adopted and adapted. Now this is my final point I wanna make when, you get to the, when I get to the global ideas of this is, they. Every people have their own ancient ideas of um, sirens or sea people, what they can do. But oftentimes, as Europeans come in, they adopt some of these Western motifs of mer people steadily. So now in, modern, in, the, in the modern world, throughout the world, you see Western ideas of mer people. 
really integrating into these societies. But that makes sense because as long as Murphy people have been around, which is basically forever, it's been about adaptation. It's been about adoption. That is the human process. That's how cultures work. We interact with other cultures. We adapt, we adopt, we integrate, we move forward. So an enduring narrative, as I say, the final paragraph of my book, from alleged sightings to merchandising to self-expression, Mer people continue to challenge humankind's perceptions of person and place. Importantly, Mer people seem to have become more and more human um, over time as we instill our own hopes and shortcomings on these fantastical hybrids. As the lines continue, to, as the lines between humans and the Mer people continue to blur, our own hybridity will become more apparent. Monstrous yet beautiful, mysterious yet predictable, humans and Mer people are not as different as many like to think. And that's what I've got. Thank you so much. I hope I stuck to time there. I kind of lost my time when I actually X out. You did uh, really well, everyone. Thank you. That was that was uh, that was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of, of thought-provoking stuff. The questions will start coming in. Um, please do ask questions. Put them in the uh, the Q and A panel. Uh, there's a couple in there that I don't want to answer. So um, yeah, please bring your please bring your. Uh, your questions in. Um, Ruth Wilkinson had, had, had a question, so well, Ruth, I'm going to offer to unmute you, your microphone so you can ask it. Oh, hi. Um, so basically, um, I know that aliens, um, aliens, fairies have been used a lot in the previous history and identified in literature, looking back at literature as being a method of identifying the other. So mm -hmm. whether that be, you know, various different races across centuries or women in some senses and actually I wondered if you felt that um, mer people shared the same kind of role or if it was purely a more kind of focused on a, a reflection of humanity unto themselves looking through it basically. No, I think definitely on the other and you know the other in different ways feminine ideas of femininity have really taken over with the mermaid so going back you know to the christian church early medieval medieval christian church expectations of way ways women should and should not act ways men should and should not interact with women etc cetera, etc cetera. going up to though just the modern day where you see um through the early or late 19th early 20th century through the 20th century ideas of women's um women as the other women where they fit in fact i didn't get into this in this as much but post you know, uh, post-femininity theory really comes in. Um, feminist theorists really start to shoot a lot of kind of shoot cannonballs over the bowels of Disney when The Little Mermaid comes out because of how she is depicted in The Little Mermaid. This idea that they're oftentimes used as very sexual, um, in very sexual ways, whether it's in Hollywood or advertisements that they, they kind of use women as sex to sell a lot. But now, by now, I, th I like that mermaids have kind of taken in this idea of creating the other traditional others, whether it be women push to the fringes of society, the LGBTQ community, they've adopted mermaids as a way to push back against those, um, you know, whether you want to call it capitalist, government, uh, patriarchal ideas of the other and where women and gender exist in this. So it's kind of come full circle in that way, if that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Great. Um, Neil Go has got his hand up. Oh. So, Neil, are you ready to go? Yeah, hi, yes, slightly related question. Um, hi, it is you, Neil. Hello. Hello, Scott. Yeah, just down the road from me in Scott, there's a, a Victorian building, late 19th century building, uh, Deptford Town Hall. It's a, a building with lots of colonial statues on it of uh, naval explorers and so on. And it's these two fantastic tritons. Of, Above the entrance, with I'll stick an image in, in the in the chat so people can see. Yeah, it. Okay. That's, that's it. Yes. and I just just kind of slightly following on from the last question is that bringing together your interests in uh, colonial history with mermaids, mm -hmm. there is something there I think as well about um, these these images of kind of exotic, fantastic uh, creatures as being uh, representing this whole kind of world that's under the rule of the British Empire. Um, yes. So here think yes. Um, one of the most famous images of Queen Elizabeth is the after they defeated the Spanish in, the Spanish Empire, um, she had a painting drawn of herself, and there's actually a mermaid right there in the painting with her. Kind yeah. of this is a like a st statue, but it's also interesting to say that because 
last time I was in, in London, I walked around, I started looking for mermaids more just around the city. And you see them, you know, because London tries to associate itself more with this in, in the English Empire and British Empire at large of this control of the seas. So you, have, of course, have like the Fishmongers Hall. You're going to see them there. But they're also carved into Middle Temple and their gates are outside Middle Temple. Yeah. You, of course, see the Triton carvings out in front of the uh, National Gallery. Um, and so it doesn't, yeah, that doesn't surprise, I'm going to look at these. It doesn't surprise me. Yep, they're exactly, yes. Yep, and you'll find, you'll find, I, I, I started, I've been kicking this around in my head, this idea of the mermaids of London, because mermaids are everywhere. They're, they're, I, I mean, I would almost, besides maybe somewhere like Venice or Florence, um, London is one of the most mermaid ridden cities you're going to find from the famous mermaid tavern to mermaid carvings to mermaid street uh that they're all over the place to, to beers named after mermaids in said taverns um so yeah they're oh mermaid token I, i've been working on this a little bit more taverns would like the mermaid there are lots of mermaids and they'd they'd send tokens out in the 16th through 18th centuries that would have mermaids on them so mermaid tokens would be circulating throughout the city um so yeah I, you're totally right on that Thanks, Neil. Good to hear from you, mate. Uh, and Crump, you have a question? I hope you're there. Don't worry if you're not. I know some people are shy. Hello? I can. Um, should I, with these Q and A's, what should I do with these, Scott? Should I answer them? Let me let me look up. Let me look after them. Um, okay. I know I'm doing it haphazardly at the moment. No, no, no I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, that's fine, no problem. Sophie Wilson, um, you've got a question too. Are you there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Who are we speaking to? Uh, yes. Yeah. Hi, it's Sophie. Hi. Thank you. That was really fascinating. I like to think that I'm a mermaid. <laughs> I swim in Brighton a lot every day. Um, but not so much an ac academic question, just really wanted to know what inspired you personally to go after. Um, mer people as a subject and if you i kind of get the impression that you don't necessarily believe in them but if you ever met one what would you say to it <laughs> or do with it so, i have it's funny you say that so i've always really liked this goes way back when i was five uh i think that's when it, the little mermaid movie came out and mm -hmm. somewhere around there but as a little boy i had a, i wore a little mermaid button on my jacket because i loved that so much i had a little mermaid barbie that i carried around so I've always loved mermaids. And I just didn't really think about it that much. But when I started, yeah, so you're right. When I started to um, find these mermaids, something about it just really piqued my interest. I, the another part of it is I grew up in Kansas, which is like the most landlocked place you can grow. It's in, literally in the middle of America. I had oceans of wheat around me. So the the ocean has always been something to me that's very interesting but i'm also kind of scared to death of it and i think that that kind of reflects these ideas of mermaids where they're at once alluring but also dangerous um and so i think that that kind of gets into it and finally with the british i'm i'm a big anglophile i love coming to england the scotland ireland wales um and when i'm there i can see i wouldn't i can kind of understand now why people were interested in it now if i met a mermaid I would ask them, where, why did it take us so long to find you? People have been thinking about that for a long time. They say, well, maybe when they die, they sink to the bottom of the ocean. That's why we've never found one washed up, or they're too smart to let us catch them. Um, but I always say, whenever I say I don't believe in mermaids, I have a caveat. And that is, we've only explored 5% of the ocean. We're dredging up weird stuff all the time. So I don't believe, but I'm open to... I don't believe right now, but if we found one, I would, I mean, hey, we just basically confirmed the existence of UFOs like four <laughs> months ago and no one batted an eye because of all this stuff that's going on. Yeah, but that's, yeah. that's potentially changes the, not to get too far, but if that's true, and if they really are something, that changes like the course of human history. So who knows? I'm open. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matt White, um, you have a question about selfies. Hello, um, really good talk. Um, and I was curious to see how you saw um, like selkies in relation to mer people. Because it's more transformative compared to yes. hybrid. 
And yeah, also I didn't, much more balanced in gender. Exactly. I didn't talk about them as much in my book because I tried not to get too much into the folklore side of mer people. I, I touch on it, but mer people human history is more kind of a how would I just, um, it, I talk about folklore and I talk about selkies and things in folklore, but I, I don't dive into the, the deep kind of analysis of that. A, because there's been a lot more done on that. And B, because if I treated selkies too much, I'd have to have basically a whole chapter on all the folklore and things. And I didn't want to go down that, that route as much. And it's all, I mean, you could argue it's all folklore, but I think selkies are way more integrated into this deep, I mean, there have been multiple. There have been multiple films about selkies. Uh, I can't think of. There was one that I, I've been meaning to watch it. There was one that came out in the '80s about. I think it was filmed in Ireland. I can't think of what it's called. Um, so I, 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 that's it. Secret of Roninish. Yeah. And so I need to. So I just I didn't want to get too much into the, the folk tales and things associated with mermaids where there weren't because I I don't I I didn't find any like verified sightings of a selkie that people said. That's what I was trying to get on to like. People are actually saying they're seeing these creatures and they have sightings. Whereas, if I'm not mistaken, selkies are usually more related through song, poem, um, mm -hmm. passed down tales. And so that's why I didn't go into them as much. Cool. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we've got a short question. I think this is quite easy to answer. So I'm going to open up the microphone of Alan. I'm really sorry, Alan, I'm not, not able to answer that. Question, where are you? Okay, they've gone. Um, Alan Schedil asks, are there, any source, are, are there any sources of reports of sightings in landlocked areas in, such as ponds or rivers? Yes, yes, cool. there are. Um, so there have been there were reportings of river sightings in Africa in the late 18th, early 19th century. And there were the, in the Great, Le Great Lakes region up in Canada. So when that Codex Canadensis, that image I shot, showed that the, the French um, priest uh, recorded, that was in the Great Lakes region. Um, and then the Virginia instance in the river. Now the, the Virginia instance in the river was more like brackish water. It's where the ocean would have connected to the river. So that's a little bit more transitory. But the, there are, in, in deep in Africa, I found them and uh, the one in the Great Lakes. But they're not as, they're not as, con oh, and Native American, ancient Native American uh, lore. There's actually a lake in the Northern, uh, up in Canada, where you can still see where Native Americans had carved, they, they, they were like hand imprints on the rocks next to the lake. And Native American people say that that's from Mer people, that they like, they touched it there. Brilliant. Um, another question, uh, and Anne Crump uh, wants to know if there's any links to Sheilana gigs. De definitely. Um, some of those final those those final images I showed. Let me see these here. Uh, Should we explain what a Sheilana gig is? It's not just a song by PJ Harvey. Yeah, I'm going to try to. It's a. Uh, Thanks, Paul. They're 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 naked. They're figure carvings of naked women displaying an exaggerated vulva. Now, here's the thing about that. I've, I could show you, if it's literally, it's an interesting, it's like a little creature just kind of like showing kind of a vulva or hole. I've, it's in my, uh, is it in my book? Yeah, it is. I found an image, one, of a spread tail mermaid with a Christian fish, not to get too graphic here, but this is what it is, a Christian fish basically penetrating her. So it's this really bizarre uh the christian fit it's it's bizarre so that's the closest thing i found i would argue that you could kind of call this the spread tailed mermaids sheila and the gigs in their own fashion um but you just don't have the actual female anatomy being displayed in graphic detail so I, you don't see that um but you 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 with that one with the christian fish it is imp definitely implying something in about a clear as fashion as you can Thank you. So I've got, we've got a couple of questions about depictions of mermaids. So I'm going to go to Andrew and then um, this looks like a Gallup name. So it's Ib Hidden. But Andrew, I'm going to open your microphone first for your question, if you're there. Uh, yes, uh, I hope you can hear me. 
Um, yes. Yeah, so um, I was actually in Zenor recently in Cornwall, okay. uh, where there's the Mermaid of Zenor there. Yes. And it, it really strikes me that uh, quite often um, uh, <laughs> the whole mermaid thing seems to have been an opportunity for people to basically portray women with no clothes on. Yes. In, in, in a way that's acceptable, that they're not real people, so we can show women in a sexualized way. Yes. Um, and <laughs> it, 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 has that got something to do with why they became popular? I, I, I don't know. Do you, I, I no, I, I think I uh, I think that this idea that sex sells or sex it, it's always been that you know we haven't something I always tell my students something I've learned more than anything is humans haven't changed the world we live in has like the way, the way it looks but we as people have not changed but we're still we're still basically the same we haven't evolved um, and I think that that's you're really onto something here and what at the at the beginning of each of my chapters I have something that I call factions it's it's fact and fiction combined. It's a, it's a fictional narrative, but it's based wholly on fact. And it's, it's about this priest in Exeter Cathedral looking up at this, this, this naked mermaid with spread tails and kind of feeling this lust towards it because he can't marry. And I think that that would have, I mean, that would have drawn people in, whether they're in bestiaries or carved into a church, that these graphic representations of a topless woman would have been quite rare in the, 13th century and so I, I think there's definitely something to that and this kind of that it's dangerous and you're it's not supposed to be good it I, I, I think you're definitely right there well, and there, it owes their ubiquity I mean there's a reason they kept showing up over and over again okay um, <laughs> yes Andrew sorry uh, yes exactly and and, and that uh, uh, there's something about them being associated with the sea uh, mm -hmm. that makes them other, and there's something about water that is sexualized as well. Um, I, I, mean, I mean, obviously, you have uh, you have folklore creatures associated with the desert and the wood and mm -hmm. whatever, but there's something particularly about th these beings associated with the sea that makes them sexual and slippery and I don't know whatever. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I, I've thought, I mean, if you want to take this even further, I mean, they're also interesting because the ultimate denial of sex at the same time, because they're depicted as these sexualized objects, but generally speaking, unless they're the Sheila and the Gig style, they don't have sexual anatomy. So where's this going? You know what I mean? So it's this interesting, weird kind of, I don't know. It's a, uh, I mean, in the, I don't know if anyone's seen the recent film, The Lighthouse, but they take that to kind of weird places in that one. Um, but yeah. Thanks. Silent Trevor is very keen to um, ask this question about um, Atlantis. Um, sure. Simon, are you there? Or have you left us? He appears to have left us. So, Silent, so apologies, um, Silent, if you're watching the recording of this. So, his question was about how, um, where's it gone? Atlantis. Oh how mermaids uh, relate to Atlantis and um, how do you see the mer people idea of Atlantis and Lemuria in relation to your thesis, Plato, etc. So, uh, well, I think that goes back to this idea of, because the whole, the, if I'm correct, the, um, uh, and yes, they are, Paula, they are seen together oftentimes, the mer people and sea monsters, oftentimes on the same maps right by each other. Um, if I'm, I mean, Atlantis was originally a, a not an, it didn't start off as an ocean city. It was a great city that was consumed by the sea. And so I don't, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't go along necessarily with, especially these ideas of humans coming from the ocean because they would have always been there. They wouldn't, maybe they, if, if you know, if there wasn't Atlantis and if there were mer people already in the ocean, when Atlantis got overtaken, they would have like gone in there and like, hey, this is nice. But I, uh, I, I don't know, I mean, if, if mer people really, they don't seem to really fit into that narrative for me. Great, thank you. Right, Sila, um, you are still there. Apologies, you didn't get to ask live. So I'm um, going to go to uh, 
Avine. <laughs> yeah, my name is Avine. Thanks. Avine. I'm, so, I'm, I'm really sorry. Irish no, you're fine. Pronounced in the world, so I, I'm really sorry there. I am. I'm used to English people not knowing how to say my name. That's totally I'm, fine. I'm <laughs> sorry, English. Um, <laughs> this is going on from the previous question about sort of uh, medieval erotica about depictions of mermaids, which is one of the putting this two together. Yeah, so basically I'm just interested by sort of the difference in depictions of mermaids that we see these days from quite childish, innocent imagery in like kids' cartoons and that kind of thing. And then obviously, you know, kind of more like pin-up style tattoos and there's quite a range yeah. there. And I guess with all the research that you've done, did you notice sort of the the imagery, you know, changing throughout the centuries? And could you speak about that a little bit? Yes, definitely. So you really get the imagery you start to change when you have the late 18th, early 19th century artists entering the fray, where they're painting them as these beautiful, I mean, you could argue that they have these, the, the, those, those bestiaries and psalters that we're looking at in the medieval period, I mean, they were kind of pin up, the closest thing to pin up style for then. Um, but you, you have this transition in the late 18th, early 19th century, where you have these famous artists like Waterhouse depicting these quite sexualized, um, idea, you know, they were very much directed around the idea of an, of an, I quote, ideal woman at that time. And from there, it trans transitions. I mean, in the 1940s, you have um, women like Ezra Will in the 50s. Uh, first, you have a net. Well, OK, so what I would argue is mer mermaids in the 20th century often reflect people's ideas of what a, quote, ideal woman is or a hyper oftentimes around hypersexually sexuality. So Annette Williams was depicted by the heart, the, the head of the Harvard physical education, did all of her measurements and everything and said, this is the ideal woman. This is the perfect woman. And so then she played a mermaid in almost all of her movies. From there, you start to have uh, women in Mr. Peabody and the Mermaid and Miranda. You have these kind of different ideas of the, the ideal woman there. Miranda plays this more sexually aggressive woman where the mermaid in Mr. Peabody and the Mermaid is more demure. So you kind of have that balance there. Um, interestingly, at the end of Miranda, she has a, a baby with a human man and she takes it out to sea with him. Um, and then you start to get into the 70s when you have the uh, 60s and especially 70s when you have the rise of like graphic pornography. And one of the first big porn, movie, porn movies is um, about mermaids. It's called The Mermaids of Tiburon. Um, and then from there, you start to get in the 1980s, where you have Splash with Daryl Hannah. And then it kind of creepily, though, and I, even uh, Ariel in The Little Mermaids, pretty sexualized the way she's depicted for a pre-adolescent, uh, you know, adolescent girl. And then you, of course, have now where you have either mermaids, you know, as like little children's figurines or these very, that's for more children, but for adults, oftentimes they're depicted pretty, um, pretty graphically. So I think that allows us to kind of trace these ideas of sexuality, gender. And then, as I mentioned earlier, now um, I saw someone that's like, do, do mermaids have sexual preference? And that's not something that's ever really, they're, they're very, they're not, they're, they are and aren't gender binary at once. They're these hybrids in that sense, again. Um, and so I, I think that right now we're, we're definitely having this renaissance, this mermaid renaissance where, you know, people are wanting to take back to sea, they can buy sea tails and things. Um, and just to end the rambling answer with mermaid tattoos, those go back to the 17th and 18th centuries where the first, the only people basically in the 17th and 18th centuries would have mermaid or would have tattoos were sailors and mermaids were some of their most popular tattoos. Now, as we have, the rise in tattoos where a lot of people have tattoos and one since they're going back to these ancient traditions of having mermaid tattoos but also i think that they're using mermaids as tattoos to speak to, to kind of get to various different kind of cultural um, identity ways um but god that was a rambling answer but to get to your idea of this idea of like sexuality I don't think that's any new, anything new. I just think that they're depicting it in different ways. Oh, also, you mentioned the pinup thing. Um, uh, Sports of Field magazine ran a very provocative full cover page in April called April Fools, where it showed a pinup style mermaid uh, that was drawn by Joyce Ballantine, who was one of the pre most preeminent pinup artists. So that even transferred over where you have pinup artists drawing mermaids as well in the 1960s so
They've that's always fascinating. Been like, thanks yeah. so much for a really complete uh-huh. answer. <laughs> yeah, sorry. That's yeah. I can go forever on this stuff. So yeah. Well, are you okay to go for? Uh, we said we'd finish at nine. Are you okay to go for another 15, 20 minutes or sure. so? There's a, there's a few more questions. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna we're gonna ignore the most frisky ones. Um, well, you've, yeah. actually, you've you've answered a couple of the frisky ones, which I'm really grateful for. Uh, sure. wait, the next question is Paula. If you're there. Hello. Um, I'm here. Uh, hi. hi, Paula. Uh, hi. I you so that's what. Answered my original question, which was whether mermaids and sea monsters are often seen together. But I was wondering if there was a kind of mini ecosystem there, whether they, I mean, obviously they're seen together in old maps Mm -hmm. and things, but are they seen to be a sort of part of the same community rather than just things that coexist? Yes. So if like you were talking about like a, you know, like Middle Earth or something in Lord of the Rings, they'd all be in that together. So you have just you have like sea monsters they're just big you know huge fish or whatever then you have tr- triton non tri but men riding seahorses with so you'll have men who don't have fish legs but they ride seahorses around and then you have hybrids half fish half humans who are swimming around all in the same space and they all they they all occupy the same theoretical world and they even interact sometimes you have these nereids who were the, they were women who were with King Triton, who was a mermaid, but they weren't full mermaids yet. So yeah, you have a lot of overlap there. They all exist in the same world, at least by early modern parlance. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, Charmaine, you, you had a question. Yeah, <clears throat> hello. Do you Hi. think it's possible that Barnum had any people in his um, exhibition who were actually like modern day mermaids, people that are born with their legs fused together. And do you think that any of the pictures were actually, people saw these people with legs fused together and actually embellished it a bit? Do you think there's a connection? He, from what I've gathered, he didn't. However, scientists were noticing this mermaid syndrome at the time. Um, and so when, when you come in thinking that mermaids could exist, when you see this, a child born this way, it's only gonna further solidify your views. Now to push that even further, Barnum didn't do this, but you do have people in the 19th century where they, that it's called the mermaid trick. So what they, well, they do one of two things. Either they'd have a woman in a tank with a, um, with and she, where she was in a mirror. There's a mirror in the tank that made it look like she was a mermaid. And you, there, there's actually, I have a illustration in my book that kind of shows how that works. They published in the newspaper, but also in a more nefarious sense, there's a man in Paris, a British man, no, in Rome, sorry, a British man who came over to Rome and he had a woman dressed up as a mermaid swimming around in the tank. And whenever she would try to come up, he'd hit her and knock her back in. So she couldn't breathe very well. And they finally uncovered this. And they're like, oh my God, this isn't a mermaid. This is a woman being basically beaten and tortured. And so he was put in jail. Um, but I haven't found any instances of actual people with mermaid syndrome in the show. P.T. Barnum had his little Fiji mermaid that was a hideous little creature and very small, but he advertised it as a classical, as a classical mermaid, like you saw in that Illustrated Police News. So he definitely, and people noted that, they came in there like, I was expecting to see this real, this, this classical mermaid, but all I found was this little hideous, screwed up as they called it, creature. Um, but I, that's a great question. I've not found any instances of, of people with m- mermaid syndrome being depicted. Okay. Thank you. Brilliant. The, the, the questions keep coming in. So um, some some good. They're getting a bit saner, which is good. Um, Stuart Leather <laughs> had a question, uh, which appeared in the chat. I don't know if you're there, Stuart, and you're free to answer. Um, don't worry if not. I can uh, re- read out your question. Let's do that. So Stuart asked, does the well-documented superstition of seafarers partly explain the prevalence of people in historic cartography, or do mer depictions appear on ocean charts like actual physical features possibly documenting sightings? Will this that's be a, answer? That's a great question. So I think that the it's more of the the most the, the majority of okay, so when you pay to have a map made. 
you could basically say, I want the ocean to have creatures to, to be inhabited by creatures and clouds and other things, or you didn't want to pay for that. If you paid for that, they would almost always place mer people out there but they placed them in certain areas where sightings were more prevalent. So they, they, even though sightings were quite prevalent around the UK, you're hardly ever gonna see them around the UK. You're gonna see them in far reaches of the ocean. You're gonna see them in more mysterious areas. That, that generally speaking, they thought the farther one got away from say London, the more likely for these strange creatures. Now, I will say that sailors, I just wrote this uh, piece for a, a, another a journal about how sailors' interactions with mermaid iconography and culture. Someone that's asked about the coffee house, uh, Ruth did. And there's a huge tie where I argue that basically sailors had two islands of mermaid culture, the ship and the, and the tavern slash coffee house. Both were oftentimes named after mermaid, were named the mermaid. Both were spaces where they would exchange mermaid identified objects, stories about mermaids, um, uh, sing songs about mermaids. So there was a lot of overlap in this, this idea of sailors and mermaid culture um, in these land and sea based spots as well. Thanks, Lance. So Stuart, sorry, he's on the chat um, and I've opened someone else's mind. So he said, so there's an ocean sighting hotspot like the Mermuda Triangle. Mermuda. <laughs> That's a good one, Stuart, first right. off. Um, not that I've seen, I mean, there are, there are areas that have claimed to be hot spots. For instance, uh, God, where was it? In Wales, uh, in the <laughs> 1980s, there was, a, there was a, I think it was in Wales, there was a city that said that they'd seen a lot of mermaid sightings and they offered a prize to whoever could come out and see the mermaid. But it was really more of a publicity stunt thing. Um, you see different, different beaches throughout the world named after mermaids. You have, for instance, Mermaid Beach in Australia. Um, so the, I, uh, you have uh, off the coast of the south um, west coast of Italy, especially around like the um, Amalfi Coast area. There claim to be a lot of sightings there. But oftentimes it's kind of a self, I, I think it's kind of a self-branding thing more than uh, actual heightened sightings. You see it in the Caribbean a lot too, parts of Mexico. Oftentimes, if you go to a beach area with a lot of tourism, you're going to see more mermaid stuff uh, as kind of a, especially today at least, as kind of a identifier. Thanks for that. Um, we've got about three more questions left. Um, Frank has been waiting to ask his question. Are you there, Frank? Maybe I've just. So Frank's question is microphone's open, so he can chime in. Um, Asked question was a question for a convenient moment. Assuming that belief in mer people is based on something more than just fantasy and fabrication, do you think there is a chance that some sightings were based on real creatures? For example, washed up deep sea fish, some of which have quite human-like faces. I love reading out this question. I definitely think there's something to this, Frank, because here's the thing. When people describe mermaids, the way they're describing them oftentimes is nothing like a manatee or a dugong. Now, when viewed from the right angle, one of these can kind of look human-like, but the way they're describing them isn't that way. And this is something my students have asked me when I talk about this. And I quite frankly don't have a great answer. Perhaps it's something that's washed up that they look at and looks rather humanoid. Uh, perhaps it's them looking in the ocean long enough and thinking they see something. Uh, but this is kind of confirmation bias. There's really something to this. Um, and the closest thing I've come to is, especially in the early modern period, people grew up surrounded by mer people in, in iconography, stories, and they expected to find them when they went out. And I don't know, but that's one of the things, I don't know what they're seeing. Um, and even uh, our Benwell and Waugh, who were these... Uh, Two, two British historians who wrote the last big book on merpeople in the mid 20th century, and it was a very excellent history of merpeople, they end by saying, look, the places where a lot of these merpeople sightings occur are in waters where there aren't manatees or dugongs. And also, they, they, they also mentioned that humans are still born with the remnants of, um, you know, you have web, web feet, remnants of um, gills, and so that, who knows, there's, 
I really don't know. I don't know is a fine answer. Um, Ruth has another question which we're going to go to, which is slightly off topic, and then we'll finish off with Simon um, because I think that's a good place to end. So, Ruth, I hope you're still with us. Uh, yeah, I am. I mean, it was partly answered in regards to the coffee yeah. shop um, stuff. So, I mean, I guess broader than that would be the fact that um, the ideological aspect of the more... So thinking about more a kind of European coffee shop where you have a lot of philosophical and ideological thoughts, whether or not the feminist issues and um, portrayals of women played into that in that way as well in the tavern houses in colonial America. Yeah, and th that's also, I mean, they are debating all of this in these taverns in colonial America. And often, I mean, you take this a step further, I have um, pottery a dishware from a tavern in colonial Maryland that has mermaids on it uh, in clear form this big it's like the main decoration there on that on the very pottery that they're using to eat their beefsteak or whatever that's not beefsteak it's not as popular in colonial <laughs> America but um, they definitely would have been and eventually they use ideas uh, in the 19th century you have women starting to use mermaids as ideas to kind of push more feminine um, you know equality and then you have men at the same time using the idea of a mermaid to reflect the ridiculousness of ever having a woman vote or something like that mm. that would be just as ridiculous as a mermaid existing so mermaids still come into and then of course mermaid by the 18th and 19th century is a code word for a female prostitute as yeah. well so they use that against them so okay cool thanks thank you so much okay, uh, thank you thank you great questions everyone from almost all of you um, so I've just tried to unmute Simon, if you, hang on a sec, I've got a message coming up. No microphone on his PC. Okay, Simon, I'm going to find your question. Um, I wanted to end on this one because it's mer people among us. So what thoughts do you have about the ideas of mermaids leaving the sea and living amongst humans, hiding their tails? That's an interesting question. That is an old idea, in fact. Um, one of the most popular comes from the 15th century in Edam, Holland, where they say the mermaid washed up on shore and they brought her up and they taught her to knit and be a good Christian. Um, you also have ancient ideas of mermaids coming on the shore and then leaving their husbands and their husbands die. Um, but the idea of that's still happening, I mean, hey, I don't know. Um, I can't imagine. I mean, we also, of course, have that in The Little Mermaid. The, the, the gruesome part of the Little Mermaid story is that she actually gives up her, her, her mer mermaid tail in a gruesome fashion to become a human and lose her, you know, and gain legs. And it's this pretty horrible metamorphosis for her that's still really analyzed by especially feminist scholars today um, as this kind of loss of female power. But I, I would say once again that I have no proof of anything like that, but people have been thinking about that a lot throughout, you know, I can't remember. There's another one, Mel Melusine, the story of her coming and living uh, her life as a human woman, but she always has to be in this, this tub, and then she reveals her true self. And of course, the film Splash does the same thing. So a lot of people have thought about that. Um, it never goes well, I guess is what I'd say. It never really goes well. Never the twain. Thank you. Great questions, everyone. Yeah, thank you so thank much, you. everyone. Great talk, Vaughan, thank you very much. Um, there would normally be applause. I think everyone's clapping over the internet. Yeah. Um, thank you for um, coming coming along. Um, we've just shared a link in the chat to uh, Conway Hall uh, video channel. The video will be up at some point in the future. Thank you very much, Vaughan. Thank you, Conway Hall. Thank you for, her, for helping. Thank you for your questions. Lovely yes. to hear from Paula and Neil there. Um, we are back online in your living room on the 19th of uh, October but we're talking about seances so I'm going to get to sit online and ask if anybody's there because I can do it <laughs> in a forum. Thank you very much everyone we're gonna we're gonna fade out now and put the incidental music back on I hope. Uh, thank you everyone basically um, let's go to the pub but obviously yes. different pubs and then more than six people. Yeah. Thanks a Thank lot. you. Thanks a lot Vaughan.